Good morning. Time for us to start our class this morning. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 5. Uh, when, or I'm sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 5. When we get there, uh, we're going to... Well, no wonder that doesn't look right. If you turn to 2 Kings chapter 5, it looks completely different than 1 King, or 2 Samuel chapter 5. In case you're ever curious, and you'll wonder why this story doesn't line up to what you, you know, put on your slides. If we can get the teacher in line, we'll be doing better this morning. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, there's uh, copies of the bulletins. Uh, won't go through all of them up here at this time, but we'll ask, as usual, is there uh, anyone that we need to add to the prayer list? Gene is homesick this morning. Uh, Samantha's traveling back to Kirksville this afternoon. Anyone else that we need to mention? If not, uh, Tommy, can I call on you to start us with a word of prayer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you. Thank you for the blessings you give to us each day. And Heavenly Father, this place we gather today in fellowship in your name. We praise your name in this. We thank you for Michael and what he's going to teach this day, Heavenly Father, that we look at the King, and we know, Heavenly Father, that your Son is the King that we look to. Be with us as we study, open our hearts and our minds, that we accept the things that you give to us, that it be thy will, Heavenly Father. Be with us this day as we worship together. Let us have the special spirit that you give to us on the first day, that we might guide and comfort each other, that in this fellowship, Heavenly Father, we are one mind and one body in Christ. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, before we get to 2 Kings chapter 5, let's do a little bit of background here. Sounds like I got an echo. Let's see if we can back those up some. Samuel, sorry. My goodness. <laughs> 2 Samuel chapter 5. Look at the slide. Don't listen to me. <laughs> this is right. I am not. All right. 2 Samuel chapter 5. Uh, so we ended last week with David and Abigail. Abigail's husband uh, is struck dead. David uh, marries Abigail at the end of the story there. And uh, we talked a little bit about the relationship between them. Uh, they're both from the tribe of Judah. There, there may have been a uh, family relationship because under the law of Moses, uh, her, the closest male relative uh, would have had the first option of marriage with her. Uh, but we don't really see any of that interaction uh, happening. We don't really know what is going on. All we know is they're both going to be from the tribe of Judah. And then we skip forward this week to chapter 5 of 2 Samuel, but we kind of skipped a lot of things happening here. Okay? So this morning we're going to talk about David starts his reign. And he's going to reign for 40 years as the king of Israel. Saul has reigned for 40 years. David is going to reign for 40 years. And we really start to see the fulfillment of a prophecy that happens back in Genesis 49, and I put this up here this morning, as Jacob is blessing his 12 sons. Remember, Jacob has come to Egypt to be with Joseph because of the famine. He lives in Egypt the rest of his life. He's on his deathbed. He calls his 12 sons in, and he pronounces a blessing on them as was customary in that culture. And he has a blessing for each of his 12 sons. And when he gets to Judah, this is the blessing he gives to him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh shall come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, or shall the obedience of the people be. 
Ultimately, it's a prophecy of Jesus coming through the line of Judah. But he talks about the kingship, the rulers of the tribes are going to come through Judah. Why would this be unusual in this culture? What number of son is Judah? Four. Thank you. You are correct. <laughs> Judah was number four. All of the honors, all of the wealth, all of the family name usually passed on to who? The first son, the oldest son. What had Jacob's oldest son Reuben done to lose his inheritance? He slept with his father's concubine. So Jacob doesn't pronounce the blessing on him. The next son, uh, Simeon, third son is Levi. The blessing's not passed on them. You may remember what they had done. Tommy, you're shaking your head yes. Do you remember what they did? <laughs> you remember when their sister Dinah was sexually molested by the Hivites, Simeon and Levi took vengeance. They went in and they killed all of the men of the city. His father called them sons of blood because of it, and he moved. He picked up everything in his house and he moved because he feared retaliation from the other people around. So the first three sons do not get the blessing. It comes through the fourth son, the tribe of Judah. And as your book points out in the beginning of the reading, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, Moses, as they're standing on the eastern banks of the Jordan River and they're getting ready to cross over into the Promised Land, Moses begins to talk to them about what they're going to encounter in the land of, of Canaan. And in Deuteronomy 17, 14, he tells them, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord chooses. Why was this unusual for Moses to even prophesy this? They had no king. They had no leader like that. Remember when they came out of the land of Egypt, Moses didn't rule over them as a king. He was simply chosen by God to lead them. And then as they began to go into, prepare to go into the land of Canaan, how was the next leader chosen? God told Moses, Joshua is going to take over. God was making the decision. The people were not deciding who their next leader was going to be. When Korah, Natham, and Abiram decided to set themselves up as leaders over Israel, what happened to them? Exactly. The ground opens up, swallows them. And then all of the people who joined in with them are killed. There is a plague that comes. So Moses is even prophesying to the people, eventually you're going to get to the point where you're going to want a king to rule over you. And when this happens, you shall set one over you whom the Lord God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set over his king. You must not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart be turned away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. So this is Moses' warning. What do we start to see the kings of Israel do? This is the part of interaction in the class. What jumps out that the kings of Israel start to do? 
How many wives does David end up having? Seven. Seven? Seven. David has seven wives. Don't even start rolling. <laughs> <laughs> what does Solomon do? The wisest man who ever lives. He has, what is it, 300 wives, 700 concubines? Thousand to get total. Yeah. I think was the number. How many riches does Solomon have? When they look at the amount of wealth that the Bible talks about Solomon having, and they adjust it for inflation and time periods, Solomon is the richest person who ever lived. Far more wealthy than Bill Gates or whoever the billionaires are in our society now, Warren Buffett and all of them. So... They, and then you can read about how many uh, horses and chariots that Solomon accumulates for himself as you go into, yes, you go into First Kings to read about this. I am right in that book. And they begin to accumulate all of these things that God warned them was going to happen. And he warns them against here in Deuteronomy 17. Moses continues, when he sits on his throne, he shall write for himself a copy of the law in this book and from one before the priest and the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and statutes that his heart may now be lifted above his brethren that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So God is giving them the instructions on when you look around and you see the nations around you with the king and you decide to set one over yourself, this is how he should conduct himself. And we see the kings of Israel don't adhere to this. The kings of Israel and Judah don't follow this instruction. Even David who is said the man after God's own heart he continues to accumulate wives for himself. So the warning is there and then you talk about the uh, book of the law that they are to read it they are to meditate on it as Joshua is getting ready to cross over into the promised land. He's getting ready to lead the children of Israel. Remember the angel of the Lord appears to him. And he gives him one instruction. Do not let the book of the law depart from you. Then your way will be prosperous. If he was going to adhere to the book of the law... He was going to be prosperous in what he did. Moses is saying the same will hold true for these kings as Israel sets them over. So this is a little bit of the background on the kings that are going to come and David's reign. Here's a little bit of what we have skipped uh, between the time David marries Abigail and 2 Samuel chapter 5 happens. Saul is killed in battle along with three of his sons, 1 Samuel chapter 31. David is told of Saul's death, 2 Samuel chapter 1. It's interesting if you go back and read 2 Samuel chapter 1, part of the chapter is uh, about David ordering the execution of the man that tells him of uh, Saul's dying because he had raised his sword and actually finished the job, so to speak. Saul was laying there dying. He didn't want the Philistines to take him alive. So the young man goes ahead and kills Saul. And David has him executed. The second part of 2 Samuel chapter 1, David laments for Saul and his family. He mourns for the death of Saul. This man who he had fleed for his life for years, who had had multiple occasions tried to kill David, he mourns. For Saul. 2 Samuel chapter 2, David is anointed king in the presence of the tribes or the leaders of the tribe of Judah. 
they began to recognize David as the next king. Now this is significant not only in the fact that it's not from the house of Saul, but it's also not even from the same tribe. Saul is from which tribe? Benjamin. Saul's from the tribe of Benjamin. David's from the tribe of Judah. So a complete shift in the leadership over the tri or over the uh, kingdom now. But as the tribe of Judah recognizes David as king, Ishbosheth, I think I pronounced that right, one of Saul's younger sons is made king by Abner. Abner was the commander of Saul's army. We're not given any indication of why Abner is able to survive the battle with the Philistines and Saul and his family are not, but Abner takes Ishbosheth and makes him king over Israel, probably in an effort to maintain his status in the nation. He knows if David is made king, he's no longer going to be significant. And then in chapter 3 and chapter 4, we have civil war between the house of David and the house of Saul. It says that David becomes, David's become stronger, the house of Saul becomes weaker. Abner realizes what's happening, that Ishbosheth is going to lose. And Abner goes to Joab, who is the commander of David's army, seeking asylum wanting to make a treaty, wanting to make a truce between the houses, and Joab murders him. Good way to get rid of your enemy, I'll just kill him. Isbosheth is murdered. Saul's house, or basically almost all of Saul's house is done away with. Uh, one thing I didn't put on the slide is during this time of conflict, Ishbosheth tries to make sure that he is the only one who can be king uh, by killing all of the other descendants of Saul. He believes he's killed all of them. One of Jonathan's sons remains, as we talked a little bit about uh, in, in the life of David over the last few weeks. But Ishbosheth is murdered, and the civil war stops. David is recognized as king over the entire nation. Any thoughts before we get into, finally get into today's reading? All right, uh, so we'll read 2 Samuel chapter 5. Uh, it has up here verses 1 through 16, but we're going to skip the names at the end because if you're great at pronouncing all these names, James, we're going to let you come up here and struggle through the names for us, okay? <laughs> all right, 2 Samuel chapter 5, starting in verse 1. All the tribes of Israel came to David in Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David in Hebron, the king made a com compact with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought, David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. On that day, David said, Anyone who captures the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those, those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and lame will not enter the palace. David then took up residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the supporting terraces inward. And he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David along with cedar logs and carpenters and stone masons. And they built a palace for David. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. After he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives in Jerusalem 
and more sons and daughters were born to him. All right, we're going to stop there. Uh, verses 14 through 16 just give the name of uh, some of David's children. Uh, these are just the ones that are born to him in Jerusalem. There's other children that we read about that he's probably had uh, before he becomes king in the city of Jerusalem. So, as David's power is consolidated, once again, it says the tribes of Israel come to him. And it's interesting the way they come to him. They have been supporting the house of Saul for this civil war that's been happening for about seven years. As David uh, is reigning in Hebron, this is when the time of the civil war that is happening. And they basically come to him pronouncing their allegiance. It is probably how we would think about it, saying we are bone, we are your bone and we're your flesh. We're all related, remember? And when Saul was king over us, we really realized, David, it was you who was fighting the battles and doing so great. They don't really mention why the house of Israel was supporting Saul's son and not David during these seven years. Kind of seems like they want to look at the good side of everything, try to uh, keep David from uh, maybe killing them or having their uh, families killed even. And it's interesting here, uh, they're even beginning to quote what God has prophesied that you shall shepherd my people Israel and be a ruler over Israel. If they knew that God was prophesying this, why they were fighting on the house side of the house of Saul, we're not really told. But we're told the elders come and they make a covenant with him and then he is anointed king over Israel. So he's been anointed by Samuel as the next king. The tribe of Judah begins to recognize him as king. And now the entire nation of Israel recognizes him as king. And David's power over Israel is consolidated. We, we won't see another uh, infighting in, in Israel until the time of Rehoboam and Jeroboam. So it's going to be about 73 years, uh, 33 years of David's rule, 40 years of Solomon's rule before we start seeing Israel fight with themselves again. We're told David is 30 years old when he begins to reign. Think of how much has happened in David's life for him to only be 30 years old. He has gone from shepherd boy in the field to being summoned into the house. His father didn't even consider him worthy to be in the house as Samuel came. You have this important visitor coming into your home. And I don't even, this child is so insignificant, I don't even worry about him coming in to meet this distinguished visitor. You know, they have to go get David out of the field, remember, bring him in. Everybody stands around waiting on David to show up. He's anointed king. Next story we see, David goes out his fight against Goliath. He's taken into Saul's house to play the harp for Saul. He marries Saul's daughter. His father-in-law tries to kill him on numerous occasions. He flees for his life. He develops a band of men to follow him. And we, we can read about his conquest. And then at 30 years old, Saul uh, is killed by the Philistines. David begins to reign in the city of Hebron. And as we talked about, the Civil War happens. Any thoughts, any ideas? Nobody this morning. Well, the, the, con you. the context is, we look at it, is uh, very much like Joseph, one of the youngest sons that Israel had, and he becomes the leader and leads his brothers. Mm -hmm. See the same thing in David. 
God chooses by the heart, not by looking at people. Uh, the younger brother of the two that uh, Isaiah had ruled over the older brother. Right. It's, it's a constant we see in here. And we, we look at an amazement because, like I say, the law says that the older son will receive the inheritance. But it is not until Jesus comes along where the oldest son receives the entire inheritance and stuff. So it's, it's, it's amazing how God looks at man, and we have to do the same thing. We have to look at hearts, not at the appearance of the individual. Uh, and that's part of the story that we have to remember for ourselves. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yes, sir. Then, uh, when he was going to take Abigail, I know that's in First Samuel. Wasn't he wealthy then? Did he get her inheritance? Had he... Under the law of Moses, he would have inherited everything that that uh, uh, Naboth would have had. He he would have inherited everything, uh, all of the land, all of the cattle, or not cattle, uh, sheep, goats that were listed. Uh, so yeah, he he would have inherited some, a degree of wealth from that uh, and, and being the king's son-in-law remember one of the uh, uh, I don't know if stipulations maybe part of the reward part of the incentive that's the word I'm looking for for going out and killing Goliath or fighting Goliath in battle was what that person's family would be tax free, tax -free. no taxes for the rest of your life, you don't pay taxes if you go out and fight, you know. So we're, we're not told what the tax rate was, but, you know, that could have been significant for David's family, you know, from a financial standpoint. Uh, and somehow, some way, remember, he, he's a, amassing supplies uh, because when he goes, he took 400 men with him. And he left 200 to guard their supplies, so they must have had a considerable uh, amount of supplies there to leave 200 men to guard it. So I, I would think David is accumulating a, a wealth as he goes through here. Uh, from a big picture perspective, you know, God's showing the people of Israel that the old traditions, right, kind of go by the wayside. Something new's coming, and this is sort of maybe preparing. Jesus, which is new and you know, the way we can say all so make sure so. But then this would be new, you know, all of this would be new. How had up until the time of Saul, how had the uh, nations been ruled? By judges. By judges. But when you look at really the story of the judges, did they rule over the entire nation? Probably not. They probably were placed in charge of one particular tribe or maybe a couple of tribes that were close by. And they were kind of the authority figure over this part of the nation. And someone else was the authority figure over these tribes down here. And then maybe someone else over these tribes over here. And, you know, we're told about 14 of the judges. Uh, there may or may not have been more. But uh, really, uh, after the time that Joshua dies, for almost 400 years till Saul becomes king, there is no one central leader over the tribe. So this would be a shift in how the people are ruled. And we do see, you know, as we've talked about the fulfillment of the prophecy that Moses makes, your people are going to want a king. God is going to decide who should be king. And this is what you do. But we start to see the kings rapidly, you know, lose sight of that. And as, as you know, we, we talked about with Saul when he first becomes king, the humility you see in him. But it doesn't take very long for the arrogance and the power, you know, the, the pursuit of power to set in. And he wants everyone to look at him as the great leader. So, what? It's estimated that Solomon's net worth was $2.2 trillion.
be a little bit of money. <laughs> Pocket change. Huh? Pocket change. <laughs> you could probably make it, you know, a couple days without having to have a job. Yeah. Two point two trillion. All right. So David and his men go up to the city of Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites. What do we know about the Jebusites? Yep. Remember, this is one of the cities that it talks about in the book of Judges, uh, the first couple of chapters, that they did not remove these certain tri or these certain uh, nations or city states from the tribe of Israel. They did not go in and utterly destroy them and drive them out as God had commanded. This is one of the cities that was a stronghold. You may know the first time we read about. The city of Jerusalem. When Abraham comes back from fighting the kings, Melchizedek. Melchizedek is from this area. So this is considered a stronghold. Uh, it's up on the side of a mountain. It's hard to get to. And they feel like we're completely safe, David. We can repel any attack that you bring against us. When you go to the end of the book of 2 Kings, Nebuchadnezzar puts the city of Jerusalem under siege for over three years before the city finally falls. So we're not told exactly how long David is attacking this city, but we're told that David takes the stronghold. And it's interesting the indication here is whoever climbs up by the way of the water shafts, it's probably how David's men entered the city. There had to be some way for them to get water into the city, to get waste out of the city, and this would have been a weakness maybe in the stronghold, or they viewed it as a weakness. So the indications maybe David used this means to get inside the city and to attack it and to destroy the city. And so David defeats the Jebusites and he moves his kingdom to Jerusalem. This is the beginning of where the reign of all the other kings happen until, as we said, Nebuchadnezzar destroys the city. So David dwells in the stronghold. They call it the city of David. And he builds a wall around the city and the, God, the Lord God of hosts was with him. David's, uh, the nations around David hear of David's successes, and they send messengers to David, probably wanting a peace treaty. They probably understand how strong David is. And this is the really the first time we see Israel as being a strong military force. And a nation to be reckoned with under the reign of David. And David is going to expand the territory that Israel holds during his reign. Solomon's going to expand it even further. But David builds his house, his palace, as it were, here. And the king of Tyre sends cedar trees, carpenters, and masons to uh, build the, this house for David. And David is assured that the Lord has established him as king over Israel and that he exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. So as Moses prophesied, God is going to place a king. He's going to choose a king to reign over them. And we start to see David as this king. And remember, the lineage is going to continue to pass from father to son, father to son, father to the son, all the way through the last king that we read of, of Judah. Not so with the house of Israel. They're constantly having infighting when the nation splits. The kings constantly change families. There's constant assassinations that happen. And somebody else, some other family takes over as king. Uh, but the tribe of Judah or the nation of Judah, it continues to pass through the lineage of David as it was prophesied that it would. 
All right. Uh, and the rest of the verses. We're moving very quick this morning. Uh, as we talked about, David took more wives and concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he'd come to Hebron. And more sons and daughters were born to him. And it's interesting. Uh, we're, we're told of all of these uh, sons and daughters uh, are born to him. We're told how long he reigns. It's an indication that 2 Samuel, the book, is written after the life of David. How else would they have known he was going to reign 40 years? How else would they have known these children were not going to be born? The story of uh, David and Bathsheba and the birth of Solomon doesn't even happen for about 10 or 12 chapters. Uh, so someone is writing 2 Samuel after David's reign has ended. All right. What thoughts and what comments do we have on David taking over as king of the nation? We're going to have a long break this morning. I, I got a question, though. Thank you. <laughs> okay. In the book of Esther, Hammond, did God tell whoever back in 1 Samuel to destroy his lineage? Yes. And did it? And Hammond came about even in Esther? Yes. Fought against the Jews? Yes. When, when Saul is told to utterly go out and destroy uh, the Ammonites, I believe is who it is. It's in 1 Samuel 15. And he doesn't. He brings back King Agag is his name. And when you look at Haman, Haman's lineage there in the book of Esther, it's said that he is an Agite. He is a descendant of this King Agag. So not only did Saul bring the king back, the indication is Saul left other people alive. Or Haman wouldn't be a descendant of this king. Uh, we're not told if David killed everyone in this city uh, of the Jebusites or not. Uh, but David's, uh, I don't remember David ever being condemned for not utterly destroying or, you know, destroying his enemies the way that God commands them to. Uh, it was Saul is the one who points out. Uh, now, David is going to uh, fight against other nations outside of the borders of Israel, and he doesn't kill all of those armies. He lets some of them go back to their home because uh, they seem to be hired armies that the nations around Israel have hired to come in and try to fight against David. Uh, David will win the battle and let some of them go back to their home. Uh, but... Yeah, God didn't tell him to go fight these people who were from over here. Uh, one of the, the uh, I, I would have to go back and do the research, but I know the army comes down from the area of Assyria, which is almost where Iraq would be hundreds of miles to get to Israel, and they're hired by the kings who are in the nation of Israel or Israel's borders and David destroys the other nations but he lets these Assyrians go back home after he you know he beats them up pretty good kills a bunch of them lets the rest of them go back home any thoughts any other comments on 2 Samuel chapter 5 All right, we can uh, go through questions real quick. If you want to turn to chap or, uh, page 81 in your book, what do the other tribes of Israel say about David? We're your bone and your flesh. And what else did they say about his military conquest? We know it was you. When you went out to battle with Saul, 
It was really you winning the battles, not Saul. Yep. So, really, it sounds to me like they've been supporting the house of Saul for seven years. They realize Ishbopheth has lost, he's been murdered, the house of Saul has fallen. And now, David, we don't want you taking vengeance on us. Remember, uh, and this was common. If you supported a different king or you supported a different leader at this point, not only would they put that king to death, they would put all of his followers to death in a lot of cases. This was customary. So uh, I, I think that they're... They're trying to stroke David's ego, trying to save their life. Why do they believe David should be king? Uh, we might have added that to verse 1, or the first question, rather. Yeah. God has made a covenant with Israel. And again, I find it interesting that they realize that God made this covenant with Israel, but we're still supporting the house of Saul. Something's not really adding up in their story here. What did David do with, with the people when he was made king? He made a covenant with them. He made a covenant with them before the Lord. Probably an indication of he's promising protection for the people, promising to take care of them. How many years did David reign as king? Forty. Forty years. Seven years in Hebron, 33 years in Jerusalem. What city did David and his men conquer? Is it the city of Zion? The city of Zion is Jerusalem. It becomes called the city of Zion or the city of David. All the same place. And this becomes the really a, a central point of uh, the rest of the Old Testament is the city of Jerusalem. So much is going to happen in this city. Uh, and, you know, what king provided supplies to David? King of Tyre. He provides him cedar trees, provides him masons, carpenters. They build a house for David. We would probably call it a palace for David in this city and what did David do after he was established as king took more compromise in life yep I don't get it I'm sorry I just <laughs> I just don't get it but you know that's not our culture uh yeah and really think about it was this a really turn out to be a positive thing in David's life or a negative thing in David's life? Probably a negative. You know. Especially, and I'm sure we'll get into it. I know the book gets into David and Bathsheba uh, further on. Uh, you know, after David's sin with Bathsheba and he has Uriah the Hittite murdered, uh, what is he told by Nathan? You know, you will have turmoil in your house for the rest of your life. You know, and we see that over and over and over in the rest of David's life, the turmoil that happens. All right, any other thoughts? Any other? Yes, sir. So uh, in uh, 2 Samuel 5.11, uh, they didn't have skilled laborers, laborers then, you think, because they were a warrior? Uh, I mean, to have a king... Do you know, or am I looking into it too much, or did he just do it as a favor, or? I, I wonder if he did it as like a political favor mm -hmm. to David, uh, because, you know, he, even when they come out of the nation of Egypt, we, we read about the artisans and the craftsmen and the way they are told to build the tabernacle and all of the gold and bronze vessels that were to go into the tabernacle so they had that skill at one point now maybe they had lost some of that over the last 400 years 
we don't know. Uh, and even when you uh, get into First Kings and Solomon starts to build the temple, he hires skilled laborers from the nation of Tyre to come down and help build the temple. So it may be that these people were so much better at it that as a political favor, they just used them. Maybe they use it to, they come down and as you said, this, this nation had ne really never been in this state. So maybe they didn't have the artisans and the craftsmen and that knowledge or that skill to be able to do this. Uh, you know, we're really not told. I always just kind of thought that he was, it's like a political favor. He's trying to build some political credit with David. I think he realizes that uh, David is going to become a very powerful uh, king. You know, Jerusalem has stood for how many years and Israel's never been able to conquer it. It's 400 years since Joshua brought them into the land of promise. David had become king and the first thing he does is, I'm going to go take the city of Jerusalem. Probably uh, got some attention as they hear about David took the city of Jerusalem. He may have been worried about his borders. His Tyre is bordering the nation of Israel. So, uh, and you see this relationship throughout David's life, even when he starts to uh, gather supplies to build the temple, he goes back to this king of Tyre and gets supplies, and then Solomon uses it to finish building his house and the temple. So it may be that they were just so much more skilled than the labor in Israel was. Anything else? If not, we will wrap up there for this morning. We'll have a little bit longer break than usual, and we'll reconvene in about 11 or 12 minutes if that clock is.